Well, we can just sing those words this morning. I just, uh, as he was playing, I, I was just going to invite you guys to join in that, just if you know the word, just to sing, How Great is Our God. Sing with me, How Great. Let's just sing it. Just sing it. Let's just stand. Let's just, let's just sing that. And so, the Father, this morning we do that. We seek you. We continually, this morning as, as we just come together, how great you are. We tell of your wonderful deeds. We rejoice, us who worship you this morning. We just thank you for what you are doing in the midst. We thank you for even regardless of, of the, the circumstances around us. We tell of how great you are. Our hearts sing it this morning, how great you are. May you just be enthroned today upon the praise of your people. May you be lifted up, exalted up today upon the, the voice of your people. May you be honored in this place today as we gather. We just thank you. We thank you for who you are, what you've done. Today, we just give our worship this morning. We give our hearts, our minds, our bodies to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Forever he is faithful, forever he is good. Let's sing about that this morning.
Aren't you thankful we don't serve a part-time God? (laughs) He's faithful forever and through every circumstance we face. His mercies are, are new every morning. And we just sing of his faithfulness and his his mighty works and his goodness and his love and his mercy that's never ending. Doesn't matter what circumstances we're facing, he never changes. He's more than amazing. Let's sing about that this morning. set the captives free. You're the king who came to serve and you're the God who washed our feet. You're the one who took our burdens and you fled upon the cross. In your kindness and your mercy, you became the way for us. Forgetting all our sins. You remember Father, we fix our our gaze on your beauty this morning. Of all the 
all the things you, you did, Jesus, all the things that you, you came to be. how powerful you are, how glorious. Just ask your kindness would rest upon us this morning, the gentleness of the Spirit. On all the things that weigh upon us that we would take up your yoke that is easy and is light. We bring all the burdens right here and right now to cast below. We don't have to continue to carry these. Breakthrough comes, Jesus, when, when you show up. I just like that thought this morning, church, the burdens, the breakthroughs. Sometimes there's, I'm, I'm just going to, however Kevin wants to just, if he wants to pause for a minute or there's, there's times where there's things we have to speak that there's never really a good time to do it. If you want to see, just be seated for just a minute. the last uh, the last three years our church our church has been a family to uh, to to our family and we don't always understand the timing as much as I like to think I do I don't And the Lord has, has led upon our hearts a, an Abram moment when God said to him, go to the land that I will show you. The Lord is moving us, our family. It wasn't something that we saw out. It wasn't something that we saw coming. But the last two months, the Lord has just been working and confirming his plan for where he wants us. And so this morning, it is with, I've already talked with the board about it, resigned this last week. But we will be moving to Whitefish, Montana. May 9th will be our final Sunday with you guys. This morning is, is one of those times where you wish you didn't have to say these words. Not something that we had planned to do in th three years' time to pack up our family and go. 
we've struggled with this. Tuesday night, I, I went home after our board meeting, and Tiffany asked me how it went, and I said, I don't know what happened. And I said, I, I just cried like eight different times. I, I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Isn't something that we just lightly said, yes, that's what we're going to go do. We love you guys. Our kids love you. But the Lord has spoke and has showed us that this is what he is asking us to do. And so for the next four weeks, I want to make the most of it with you guys. Just as we were singing the songs this morning, how faithfulness, his faithfulness, how wonderful he is. This isn't, these transition seasons aren't the end. And you guys are a wonderful group of people, those online still, those who are joining on Facebook. This is a wonderful group of people here that we have come to really love. It will be, for us, one of the most special seasons that we ever had. I don't care what's to come next. The season we had here was so special that we needed you guys more than you realize. And I said that the first day we got here. We needed this. I don't care how much you think you got out of me. I can guarantee you I got more out of you than you did me. Because you guys know how to love. I haven't been the best. I haven't been the perfect. Didn't try to be. Just try to be me and try to be real authentic. But you guys were so gracious through all of it. I don't care who comes next. They're going to be so blessed to be here. And I'm not saying that just to say it. If I didn't think it was true, I think you'd know I'd say it. <laughs> you guys are a wonderful group of people that understands what it means to be the church. And you're on a journey growing into that. But you've been so understanding. We love the community of Carthage. From the first moment of stepping into Carthage, we, we just loved this community. We have Jody back there who, soon after moving here, went to the food pantry and got to meet Jody, one of the first people I met. And I've loved to been, I have loved being a part of her heart for this community and everything that she does with them. There's so much more I could say, but I love you guys. So things will change and look different over the next few weeks as we prepare for this next season. But we are here. So please, feel free to continue to stop by, continue to whatever you need to do in these next few weeks. We're going to be here. We're still, we are still a part of this family, and I hope to continue to be a part of this family regardless of where we ever live. So sign up to babysit our kids. <laughs> Thought that was a good punchline, but maybe not. <laughs> Feel free to come by and keep on hugging on them, keep loving on them. They know we've talked to them about this because if we hadn't, all of you would have known last Sunday. <laughs> Michael was trying to tell everybody he saw that he was moving. It's like, no, buddy, you can't do that yet. <laughs> but we're going to enjoy these last weeks we have with you guys. We are. We're not going to just fall off the map. We're going to enjoy these final weeks with you guys, all right? 
I don't know what our schedules will look like, but if we have to somehow squeeze you in, we will. If you have questions about all of this, feel free to, to come afterwards or through the week and sit down, but I, I'm not discouraged. It wasn't something going on that made me want to leave. None of that. This literally came out of nowhere, and the Lord's working for this, and we don't understand, but we feel this is what we're supposed to do. And so... Feel free to sit down sometime if you want to talk about more of it, but that's my news for my family this morning. And so I just want to go to a moment here right now and just, and just prayer. And just pray for the season that we're entering into. The season of transition, the, and I believe even this morning, the beginning to of just the Lord's uh, leading into the next pastor of this wonderful church. It's not too soon to start that prayer right now. To pray for your church board. And so, Father, we do that. We, we this morning, we, we pray for all the hearts of our church in this. I thank you for this, this group of people and what they have meant to me and these few years has made it seem like so much more. We don't always see the big picture and understand everything, but it's the moment by moment obedience that we live for. And as you speak, we listen, and then we s obey into the, the word that you have given us, and that's what we have felt, that you have called us. And I pray for this church right now as they enter into transition. Just as Israel went from a transition of Moses to Joshua. You're going to equip leaders in this church. You're going to equip this body. I, I, I just ask for, for such a, a mercy and grace upon this time that they would come together in a bond of unity and love and continue to seek your face, continue to serve your mission. And as they prepare for a new pastor, that you are already preparing in the heart of that person, that individual and that family. You're putting the, 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 that passion in their heart right now for this church and community to continue to spread the kingdom wherever we go. The reign and leadership of Jesus over this region to anoint believers to fulfill what you have called us to. We know your faithfulness. We just have sung about it. How wonderful you are. You are more than amazing. And for such a time as we're in now, may we just meet it head on with wisdom and discernment from the Spirit. We don't have to understand every aspect of it. And I know, Father, there's going to be days ahead of tears, of laughs, of memories. And so may we just find ourselves with all the different expressions that will go on 
of a love in this group of people that is shared. I thank you that when these things come along, I'm thankful for your goodness as the good shepherd. And so we just turn our eyes to you. We trust that you're going to lead through every step of this way. Give confidence and boldness to the board members. Give them eyes to see what you're up to, what you're wanting to accomplish, what you're doing, who you're leading to this church and community. I thank you this morning as we receive this news. I thank you that it is not met with one who is not in control. But you are. You know the ways that we go. You know the ways that we take. <laughs> I was kind of hoping for a little song to <laughs> but we'll just uh I want to spend these last few weeks with you in a, a passage that um, I, I, I think I made mention of this, and I really wanted to look at it before. So for the next four weeks, we're going to look at the, uh, the parable of the sower. And really... Four weeks of this, we're going to talk about the four different soils that is met with the seed. I love this, love this text, and I just felt like the Lord laid on me to to finish these few weeks with this, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to spend our few weeks together understanding. These soils that Jesus speaks about, the seed that is sown. So let's, uh, let's enjoy these weeks together as we do this and continue to get everything we can from what Jesus has to tell us about this uh, parable. It's in all the, uh, Mark has an account of this, Luke has an account, Matthew has an account. We're going to primarily look at Matthew's account, Matthew 13, and I want to read a couple uh, verses out of Mark's account with it, but we're going to primarily look at Matthew's account of this uh, the next four weeks. So if you want to open to Matthew chapter 13, A few weeks ago, I had shared a message with you where we looked at Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, wherein when Jesus says, says the words, 
that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that is spoken from God. And the, the Greek word, uh, rhema, is the word that is used when we talk about the word spoken. It literally means when God utters. When, when there's an utterance of God, that's this word rhema. And it's used all through, uh, it's, all, it's used all through the New Testament. But when Jesus said that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that is spoken from God, if, if, we, if we live by the presence of something, then we die by the absence of it. So if we live by the presence of the word in our life, then when we get away from the word, the absence of that, the opposite is true. We don't live by it, then we, we die by the absence. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Paul reminds us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing, the NLT puts it, hearing the good news about Christ. Same, same concept, same understanding, as we probably read that in the original sense. Faith comes by hearing, and we're going to talk about hearing because that's what Matthew chapter 13 this is when Jesus begins this parable, he begins with this word, listen. And in there is a, a big exclamation mark. In other words, Jesus is expressing a word. He, he wants to, to, to grab the attention of the audience. You need to listen. And he actually goes on to talk about that, that if you don't understand this one, how will you understand any other? This, this parable about the, the, the sower and the seed um, and the soils is one of the most important foundations for us as we understand our role then to go and to sow the seed. And what is the seed? Well, Jesus uh, tells us in this, in Matthew chapter 13, that the seed is the word. If you look at verse 18, he, he goes on those first few verses. He explains um, some things about, about the, uh, the soils, verse, and then he gets into verses 10. And we're going to look at this here in just a second, but let me just kind of go forward and then I'll go backwards real quick. But, but then he says in verse 16, I want you to see this, but blessed are the eyes because they see and the ears because they hear. I tell you the truth. You see, we don't argue with what the truth is. Now, obviously, there are plenty of people who do argue of what is truth. But if we will have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, then when we hear the truth, we will know the truth. And Jesus said the truth will set you free. But faith comes by hearing. In other words, this whole parable is about how well, number one, we are in fact hearing. And number two, are we in fact seeing? And hence, what is the greatest thing that the enemy has against the unbeliever? Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it says that the enemy has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever. He has blinded the eyes of of the unbeliever. So the essence of this parable is about whether or not we are actually hearing and not just unbelievers because when you get into these four soils, the first soil we'll look at today is the soil of unbelief, which, which is the unbeliever. But these next two soils that we'll look at, and then the final, the, the one that is fruitful. But the two souls in between are believers. And so we really need to hear and see when we get to those as believers. But let's, but this morning we're going to look at the first one, verse 19, 
Jesus explains to us the seed that fell on the pathway represents those who hear the message about the kingdom but don't understand. The evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in the heart. And so this is what Jesus had said about when he goes out, the farmer scatters the seed across the field. This seed fell on pathways and the birds came and ate it. Because the seed, if I mean, the picture's what it is. The seed falls on the ground, but there's nowhere for the seed to go. So as it lays on top of the soil, birds come and eat on it. When the seed, the message of the kingdom is comes and it's plant, it's, it is sown, there's nowhere for it to be planted because the soil is so hard. This is what we call the unplowed heart that leads to what we call the hardened life. People who had, and we'll, we'll look at this, what is the hard heart? But it's the pathway that lacks understanding. And so when you and I, when the seed gets scattered, if you've ever scattered seed to someone who has a hard heart, things will immediately come. The enemy, the evil one, will immediately come and snatch it away so there is no response to the seed that we scatter. If you've ever been there before, you know what it's like because you get so agitated and you feel like this, nothing's ever going to come of this. If you've ever had those people that, you have, that you've had relationship and conversation with over and over and you're praying that they'll receive it and it just seems like every time you get around to it, they tell you something, it's not for me or I don't want to hear about it and you just feel like you're getting nowhere with it. That's this soil. But that's because... The individual does not have the soil that is ready that the seed can take root into, but rather it lays on the surface because there is no hearing and there is no seeing. The rhema, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, which means we do need to continue to scatter the word. Never stop. Just because somebody doesn't respond to you the first or the 80th time, keep scattering the seed. Is there a problem with the seed? No. There is nothing wrong with the seed, which is the word of God. Mark's account, Luke's account tells us this. What is the seed? It's the word. Is there anything wrong with the word? Well, let me read you a scripture. First Peter Chapter 1, verse 23, if you want to look at that, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. It says, you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. Where does it come from? The word. Eternal. It never will have an end. There's nothing wrong with the seed. The, the seed has the potential, the seed of the kingdom. This is, what, this, is what Matthew, this is what Matthew says, those who hear the message about the kingdom but don't understand it. The seed of the kingdom has the potential for the kingdom harvest. So there's nothing wrong with the seed. And, and people will look at this and say, well, well, well why does the, the farmer sc scatter the seed just everywhere? Well, it's because there's, the seed has potential for a kingdom harvest. And so we don't, we don't just go out and say, well, we'll put some here or, or we'll put some there or we'll, we'll look for the people who, who seem to be ready to receive it. How do you know? You see, I've, I've, I've talked to believers before about this, that, that you know, they only look for the opportunity of people who are ready to receive. And I'm just like, how do you know who that is? The sower scattered the seed everywhere. Because the person that, that you may have overlooked that said, yeah, they're not ready, may be in fact the person that the immediately that you say something to them, the soil is beginning to get ready. And if you don't put the seed in that soil... You're going to miss the opportunity. So the opportunity is not who you think. The opportunity 
could be the very person that you think they're not ready for. You see, that's why I, I really like that, that picture of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. If you remember that story in the book of Acts chapter 8, where he, he begins to go some direction down a road. He's like, why on earth am I going this way? And then all of a sudden, the chariot comes up, and he begins to realize, he hears him reading, and he begins to ask questions. We never know. So the, so the, so the farmer, the sower, is going to scatter seed, and that's what you and I do. We need to trust in the seed because it is eternal. It is the word. It would seem, if you look at Matthew chapter 13, so, so let's look at just real quick, verses 10 through 12. So the disciples came and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to people? He replied, you're permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have the abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. And this is why I use parables, for they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they really, but don't really listen or understand. And it fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. Sometimes we read this and, and we kind of get this idea that Jesus is keeping truth from somebody. He's keeping something from us. Why would he do this? But really, it wasn't, Jesus didn't teach in parables to try to exclude people. Rather, what he was doing was weeding out those who lacked the interest to actually hear and try to understand. So, so crowds of people would come around and they would begin to listen to Jesus wherever he was at. Jesus would begin to teach in parables, and a lot of people would say, well, you know, this doesn't make sense, so what would they do? They would leave. The point of the parables was really to, to, to capture those whose hearts were beginning to respond, although they didn't understand, but for those who didn't, in fact, their hearts became hardened. Kind of like Pharaoh in the Old Testament, good example. How often they would come to Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh would say, Pharaoh would say yes, and then he would, he would harden his heart in response. And then it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And we're kind of like, well, why would he do that? But, there, but the reality is that Pharaoh, the soil of his heart, was not actually receptive to listening to what God said. So when God said, let my people go, Pharaoh in his heart, although he said leave, in his heart really he already hardened and lived with a soil that was hard, that lacked the understanding of what in fact he was saying. Hence why it says God Harden the heart of Pharaoh. If you listen to Romans 9.18, it says, Therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens who he wants to harden. So in God's submissive will, he allows people's hearts to be hardened. I love this. Uh, I, I don't even, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't even remember who, I, I wrote this down years ago, and I don't know uh, if this was Charles Spurgeon who said this. Maybe you guys can look it up. I don't know, but I wrote this down, and I, I, I really liked the, the, the analogy between these. By the one and same act of grace, God's one heart is softened, but another is hardened. <laughs> like the person determines the act of God, like the ground that receives rain, if cultivated, it brings forth harvest. If not, it brings forth thistles and thorns. The rain caused both, but the ground determined what would come. The sun hardens and liquefies. One act of the sun will harden clay while it will melt wax. Put another way, the, 
same sunlight that melts ice also hardens clay. So it all comes back down to the, the source and the foundation of which is receiving what has been given. And so when Jesus taught in parables, it, was, it wasn't meant to obscure the truth, but rather it nurtured the hunger for those who, who truly wanted to hear and then seek what was this that Jesus was teaching. And so he taught in parables. And if you look at verses 11 and verses 25 within uh, Matthew, verse 11, he says, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. And then if you look at verse 25, but the night as the worker slept, his enemy came, planted weeds among the wheat and slipped away. And so in both acts, there is a sense by God who is allowing things to come and happen. But the receptivity is dependent upon the soil that we have. I already read this verse, but just allude to it again. Second Corinthians chapter 4, the enemy comes and he blinds the minds of unbelievers that they cannot respond. Which means you and I need to be praying pretty diligently that light will begin to open eyes. This is what we, this is what we looked at last week at Easter. This was Paul's message in Acts 26. That light would shine in darkness, that they would open the eyes. See, people have their eyes blinded by the enemy, Satan. And so we just immediately, if something doesn't come of it, we just give up and think there's, there's nothing there. We move on. If you have unbeliever friends that you communicate with often and you share the gospel, you share the word with, you share life with, please keep scattering the seed because our hope and belief is that one day that seed is going to break through, that hard heart is going to get softened, and just in a moment, that seed's going to get just planted enough in them. And they're going to come to light and understand what Jesus did for them. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. That's what Paul said, Galatians 6. Don't lose heart. The hardened heart, one of the best uh, New Testament scenes, if you open to the book of Mark, let me just read to you. A couple, uh, a couple scriptures here. Mark chapter 3. Listen to what Jesus said. Mark chapter 3 verse 5. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Do you remember what, this, what the context was? If you go back up, he's in the synagogue. He notices a man that has a deformed hand, but it's the Sabbath. And every good religious person knows you don't do anything on the Sabbath. Do you know Jesus talked about this often with the Pharisees? They, they would come and, and Jesus would say, well, don't you uh, untie or don't you lead your, your, your mule to the water on the Sabbath? And, and then they stumble over their words. And, but they were always coming after Jesus when it came to the Sabbath. And so they watched him closely. His enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they would plan to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. And so Jesus says to them, Jesus didn't care who was, who, who was watching. He said to the man with the deformed hand, come and sit in front of everyone. Well, let's just go ahead and put you on the, on the pedal. Let's just put you out front of everybody. <laughs> he gets the man to come out. And he turned to the critics. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is, or is it a day of doing evil? Is this a day to save a life or destroy it? But they couldn't answer or they wouldn't answer. Because they wouldn't respond, 
he became, it says, he turned around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by what? Their hard hearts. In the same Matthew chapter 6, we look at verse 51. There's another interesting scene, though. Maybe we uh, don't spend too much time maybe looking into. Remember after Jesus walks on water? He climbs into the boat. The wind stopped. They were totally amazed. We just sang about that. You are amazing. But they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Jesus did just perform the miracles of the loaves. And then he gets into the boat. He walks on water, all these things. They're still not understanding the miracle of the loaves before. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. So we're talking about the disciples here. Their hearts were still lacking understanding to actually receive what Jesus just did. In some ways, we too, not often, but in some ways, we too live with this, this path of lack of understanding. And even in times, it can seem like the ground of our faith can almost begin to get hard again. The person with the hard heart Let me just read a couple things, some, some thoughts. A hard heart will feel no need or desire for the message. No sense of, of the, the effects of sin. Satan has no problem with these people because they, they live blind to it. There's no understanding of it. They just continue to do what their desires are. And what it does is it makes it easy, Jesus says, it makes it easy for then the birds to snatch it away because nothing is guarding it. It's just laying there. The word is scattered. We, we give them the word, but because it's hard, it just falls on them and it just lays there. And so the birds come down. Things of life begin to take it away. Other people's voices begin to take it away. Other things they know and see begin to take it away. And before long, what you said to them is gone. You come back again. You say it again. You have that conversation. Same thing again. It just lays on the ground of their heart. Other voices begin to speak. Other things come back, and it's gone. And that's what this parable, this very first seed is about, is, is that the soil becomes so hard because so many other things of life speak louder than the voice of the seed in there. We're actually going to find this very interesting that the next soils, next two soils work very similar in the believer. The thorns and the thistles, the things that come up, it's because they speak more, they speak louder than the voice of the seed that is of the plant. The weed grows up at the same time. Very similar in aspect for the believer as it is for the unbeliever. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. So Paul writes about the Gentiles. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against them. 
They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. They've closed their minds and they've hardened their hearts. There is no desire of a response to the seed. There's nothing wrong with the seed. It is the word of God. It is the pure word of God, living and active. Sharper than a double-edged sword. It can penetrate. It can do everything in a person's heart. But if their heart is hardened, the birds snatch it away. There has to come a point for that person where just enough is open in the mind to receiving. And we keep praying for that. Listen to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 14. Blessed is the one who always trembles before God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. Those who harden their hearts fall into trouble. You see, this is a word that we need to, that we really need to, to, to proclaim. If you want to use the word preach, proclaim, but, but do it with gentleness, though, and respect. Don't, don't, don't tell people that they need to get over their hardened hearts, but, but with gentleness and respect, we need to let people know that their hardened hearts is going to lead them to get in trouble because, because here's what it says. Um, it is Romans, I think it's, uh, I think Wendy has it up there, Romans chapter um, 2, verse 8, uh, verse 5. But because you're stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself for the day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. You see, this day, this day is coming. People who have hardened hearts need to realize the severity of what happens when there's a hardened heart. Pharaoh had a hardened heart. Eventually, he does let the people go. But do you know what he does after he lets the people go? He pursues them with his army. Well, guess where they ended up? <laughs> Drowned. <laughs> Micah just said, where? <laughs> where? He's like, tell me the story, Dad. What happens? They ended up being drowned. Terrible, terrible punishment, Paul says, for those who live and continue with the hardened heart. And so there's a scripture that we look at, Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Here's what it says. So righteousness for yourself, reap the fruit of unfailing love. And break up your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. It is the time to break up your unplowed ground and time to seek the Lord. This is the word for the person with the hard heart. We need to get that ground broke up and seek the Lord. Because faith comes by hearing, Hearing by the word of God. When God speaks, when we speak the word, it initiates faith. As people hear the word, that's all, we, that's, what we, that's all we have to do for people. We have to get people to hear the word. You see, it, it's not about trying to win a battle, win an argument, or convince someone of something, it's, it's the word, the seed. We need to scatter the word into people's hearts and continue to scatter the word into people's hearts. And as people hear the word, our prayer is that the more and more that they hear the word, faith is going to be initiated in them. Something about their life is going to come to a moment where the ground's going to begin to get broke up. And the truth that sets free is going to begin to speak in that part of their life that really needs it. And God is going to begin to plant the righteousness in them. But we also have 
two other seeds that we have to look at as well along the way. But this is the first seed, and the first soil that receives the seed. It is the seed of the lack of understanding. It's the seed of the hardened heart. But God wants to break through that with people today. And so continue to pray for people you know for those breakthroughs and that we're plowing up those hard grounds and letting the rhema, the voice, speak life, speak the salvation message into people's hearts that sets them free. Father, we thank you this morning for the word and for us as believers, we are so thankful for the word. For unbelievers, they, they, they live with a desire not to hear it. But this morning, if we have a name that comes to mind, and a family member or a friend that comes to mind, we're praying right now for a breakthrough that as we continue to, to speak the word, as people hear it, rather than like the people who ask you know, about parables and would, and would walk away, but, but that in fact people would have a hunger that it would produce a hunger within them for more. And it may take time, but we, we just continue to ask that there would be a hunger, an appetite produced within them for more. And that the hard heart would get broken up. People will begin to um, begin to plow their hearts to receive the seed, the message of the kingdom, receive the word that is life, that brings light because of your love for each person. We thank you this morning. We thank you for the word. And as we see, it is a seed. And may it be planted today and produce a harvest of righteousness for your glory. We pray in your name. Amen. I invite you to stand. We're going to sing a song titled, You Are My King.
So today, church, as, as we leave, may that be our, our declaration today. Jesus, you are our king, and we want to honor you in everything that we do, everything that we say. So may we go today and live, live as ambassadors in the kingdom, reflecting you, Jesus, everything that you stood for, everything that you taught us, who you are. We go today to only speak that to which you have given us to speak. May you be blessed today, church, as you go, and let's continue to be the light of Christ to the world around us. Amen. <laughs>